At the eastern end of Long Island, where the jaws of the North and South Forks gape, you'll see on the South Fork a creek bounded by barrier spits across the bay from Gardner's Island. We call it Akabonic Creek. Some call it Akabonic Harbor. We are the Akabonic Protection Committee, a group of citizens whose aim is to protect our creek and its watershed, its health and its beauty, for ourselves and for others, now and in the future. Sunset on Akabonic. This is Akabonic Creek. You can see that half our landscape is sky and that half our 24-hour day is darkness. And this is the Milky Way. Every life form on our Earth has evolved with these starry skies as company, the moon and sun as the markers of time the great rhythms of day and night, dark and light, as the foundation of their existence. We are part of this natural world, and these rhythms are built into our bodies too. Every human culture has paid enormous attention to the cycles of the heavens, because in them were hidden the mysteries of the seasons, as well as the days. Hunters could predict the movements of game. When agriculture developed, knowledge of the seasons made the difference between crops and starvation. The secrets that animals and plants had built into their DNA, humans formed into religions. It is no accident that the constellations in the night sky were named for gods and heroes, and that the meteorites were thought portents of fate and future. Yes, like half of mammals, we were creatures of the daylight. The dark did contain dangers for us. There were large carnivores about and reptiles that came out at night. We kept these dangers at bay with fires, so connecting light with safety goes deep with us. Now, the things we feared then are no longer threats to human survival. And yet, we are turning ever larger amounts of the nightly cycle into a perpetual false daylight. Generations of people have lived who never saw the real Milky Way. Our ancestors could never have imagined that the loss of the darkness would turn out to be a serious loss. Only now are we finding out in detail how serious it is. It all started with the astronomers. I'm Seal Downs, and I'm here talking to Dr. Mike Inglis, who teaches astronomy at Suffolk County Community College and is the author of many books on astronomy. Dr. Inglis, may I call you Mike? Yes, you can. Okay. Um, would you tell us how all this ruckus started in Tucson with astronomers at their observatories? Sure. Um, the problem arose because astronomers were noticing that it was getting more difficult to find and observe fainter objects. From their observatories on the mountaintops surrounding the city, they noticed that they were losing their view of the night sky. 
The stars were obscured by light that was emitted from unshielded fixtures, hitting moisture and particles in the sky, creating what we astronomers call sky glow. Following this, the astronomers set up an organisation which is called the International Dark Sky Association. And working with the city fathers, they enacted outdoor lighting regulations so that fixtures would direct the light downward toward the ground and out of the sky. This movement, which is called Dark Sky, has become international, resulting in lighting laws all over the world, including the Czech Republic, the Lombardy region of Italy, and many US states and municipalities. The state of New Mexico has even enacted a Night Sky Protection Act, recognizing the night sky as an historical and cultural resource. And in fact, parts of New York State are recognized as some of the darkest skies in the United States. I teach students who have never seen the dark night sky. They've never seen the Milky Way. And we have to do something about it because all of us are aware that we must uh, look after the planet. And I'm all for saving the whale and looking after rare animals. But it doesn't stop when it gets dark. One of the great sights of, the of, of anybody's life is seeing a completely dark sky. And this is getting very rare to see there. Fortunately, the darkest sky I've seen on Long Island is the east end of the island. And um, hopefully with um, local authorities taking this into account, we'll have more dark skies. And we can see one of the great and wonderful parts of nature. The blight of urban sky glow stops children from wishing on stars and lovers from counting them. Light pollution severs our human connection to the beautiful celestial creatures of the night. Hi, I'm Susan Harder. I'm a dark sky advocate working on the issue of light pollution as a member of the International Dark Sky Association. I'm here with Jody Grinrod, who is an environmental educator with the group for the East End. Hi, I'm going to talk a little bit about the effects of night lighting on flora and fauna. Flora and fauna have evolved over hundreds of millions of years in a bright day, dark night cycle with moon phase simulated behaviors. Development of lighting in rural areas has implications for wildlife since day length which influences the activities of plants and animals may become altered or extended. Nocturnal animals are likely to be disturbed by the presence of bright illumination and could be deterred from using established foraging areas. Crow and pigeons have been found to be greater in number in all night lighted areas because owls and predators will not thrive there. In particular, security lighting, or sports flood lighting, on premises alongside river corridors, in foraging areas, or near other areas of open countryside may be seriously detrimental. Beneficial effects have been reported for fast-flying bat species feeding on insects attracted to street lamps, some observers have suggested that continuous lighting along roads create barriers which bats will not cross. The attraction of birds to lights has been known for a long time. A close correlation has been demonstrated between commencement of dawn singing in thrushes and critical light intensity at sunrise, suggesting that artificial lighting may modify the timing of natural behavior patterns. Reproduction in birds is photoperiodically controlled and artificial increase of day length can induce hormonal, physiological, and behavioral changes initiating breeding. Fledgling puffins and petrels have been observed attempting first flight unsuccessfully when flying not toward light reflected on water but toward artificial light. In addition, Bright lights such as those on telecommunication towers, lighthouses, and other tall structures may attract and disorient birds, especially on moonless nights, resulting in mortalities. 
Sea turtle hatchlings emerge from their nests at night and orient themselves using visual clues, such as light. Moonlight on the water draws them towards the ocean. And land-based lights lead them toward death by predators, dehydration, exhaustion, or on coastal highways. Frogs' reproduction, foraging, predator avoidance, and social interactions are affected by light at night, as well as their night vision, which leaves them vulnerable. Nocturnal salamanders delay foraging periods, limiting food intake, depressing their rates of growth, reproduction, and survival. The habitat of western long-nosed snakes is declining because of light at night encroachment. Moths are attracted to light at night, and light at night disrupts their navigation, suppresses flight, interferes with mating, dispersal, and migration. Daphnia, which is a zooplankton, does not consume algae on lit waterways since it relies on a reduction in light at night as a signal to rise to the surface. For plants, the main effects are that some short day plants will not flower if the night is shorter than the critical length, while others will flower prematurely as a result of exposure to the photo period required for flowering. Trees, particularly sycamores, will grow more rapidly and much later into the dormant season in continuous light, resulting in severe winter dieback and stress. These observations are based on preliminary studies which found that the habitat of every species studied was negatively impacted by night lighting. Thank you, Jody. And we are impacted too. We humans find night lighting very useful to extend our day for productivity and entertainment. However, there is a cost to our health in lighting up the night that's receiving greater attention and is the subject of new medical studies. We're familiar with the effects of jet lag when we disrupt our biological clock, but there are even more serious consequences emerging. When humans are subjected to light at night, referred to as LAN, our circadian rhythms are interrupted. Since our bodies have evolved over millions of years in the day-night cycle, artificial light at night, which is only about 100 years old, disrupts important 24-hour regulated biological functions. This disruption is the cause of major health issues, including diabetes, higher rates of breast and prostate cancer due to reduced melatonin production, sleep disturbances, weight gain, a rise in blood pressure, and is suspected as a contributing factor for childhood leukemia. The evidence is clear that when we interfere with the natural day-night cycle, consequences, including disease, will result. A lit nighttime environment also results in a loss of our connection to the nocturnal environment and a loss of the valuable experience of knowing our place within our universe when we can't see the magnificent star-filled sky above. Another health and safety issue is glare from bare or unshielded light bulbs within our field of view. Glare interferes with night vision adaptation and is dangerous for drivers and pedestrians because the eye will adapt to the brightest light source. Our eyes involuntarily move towards bright light, diverting our eyes from the roadway. Fatal traffic accidents have been attributed to glare interfering with driver's vision. And as we get older, it's even a bigger problem. Since our eyes lose elasticity and do not adapt as quickly, making it even harder for us to see when glare is present. Glare can be an issue for boaters since dim maritime navigational markers can be obscured by glare directed outward from land. Glare can also be a nuisance between neighbors and adds to visual clutter. Even when glare is reduced, there can be vision issues when the fixtures are not well designed to distribute the light evenly on the ground. Uniformity is important, dark to light contrast, since high contrast shadows make it even harder to see. We know that our health is impacted by toxic particulate, 
when we burn fossil fuels for energy. Most electricity is still generated by burning oil, gas, and coal. The resulting air pollution travels eastward, dumping large amounts of toxic chemicals and particulate onto our lands, into our water, and into our lungs. Over a quarter ton of coal is burned to power a 100 watt light bulb all night long for one year. Much of our night lighting is unnecessarily emitted upward and across property lines by poorly designed night lighting. Recent studies conducted in Los Angeles have even shown that light emitted up into the atmosphere interferes with the chemical cleaning of air pollution by 7% per night. Using night lighting in a responsible manner for safety and utility could save billions of dollars in the U.S. alone. Light trespass is the result of light being emitted onto another property when it is not needed or desired by the adjacent property owner. Sometimes this light enters the bedroom of a neighbor, which can aggravate neighbor relations and even affect their health. My own neighbor had a common floodlight that illuminated my bedroom. This was an annoyance, but I became alarmed to find there were health implications. When I looked into the town's existing regulations, it appeared to address the problem, but I was told that the law was not clear and could not be enforced. In researching lighting regulations, I found that clear, professionally recognized definitions needed to be added in order for the intent to be enforceable. When made clear, lighting issues can be easily solved with educational information about the how and the why. Fortunately, it's easy and cost-effective to change lighting that causes glare, light trespass, and sky glow, known as light pollution. Light pollution can be reversed without sacrificing safety or security if we accept change, but change can be hard. In the past, much lighting was installed without regard to where the light was emitted. For example, from this common floodlight fixture, over one third of the light from this fixture is emitted up and outward, never hitting the ground. When we use shielded fixtures with the bulb recessed up into an opaque cap or add a shield, the light can be directed toward the intended target, effectively avoiding glare from a bare bulb. For a very good example of a shielded fixture, check out the glare buster. It was designed by an astronomer. A local affordable housing complex changed out all their wall packs to the glare buster. The residents were then able to approach their doorways without glare, and every year the complex saves over $1,000 on electricity. Shielded fixtures illuminate the ground better and with one-fifth as much energy as two of the common floodlight bulbs. It has become much easier to find shielded light fixtures, and some are now available from the big box stores. The International Dark Sky Association has developed a certification program to assure compliance. Retailers are now labeling their selections Good Neighbor Lighting or Dark Sky Lighting. An example of an institution that saw the light and made changes to address their light pollution issues is the Spring School in East Hampton. The school agreed to replace all unshielded wall packs with shielded fixtures and to conform to professional light levels for safety. They also installed automatic shutoffs for the lights when the building is unoccupied. Previously, there was so much glare around the school that in the fog through the woods, it looked like the school was on fire. Yeah, they were burning energy. Parts of the parking lot did not have enough light, so we utilized light fixtures that conform to uniform professional light levels in the areas that are intended for pedestrians. The school had developed a dark sky exterior lighting policy, which unfortunately was not followed when the lighting was specified for their new bus parking lot. The poles are too high, and more light is actually falling outside the fence than within and the timing controls are not automated for the hours of use. 
When leaving lights on during the day, it's exactly like watering our lawns when it's raining, wasting energy, and contributing unnecessarily to global warming. However, not all the lighting was changed at once. Some lights are still left on, only providing a sense of security, not real security. Too often the knee-jerk reaction to crime is to just add more lighting. But lighting by itself does not deter crime, according to the U.S. Department of Justice. I agree that it seems a bit counterintuitive to shut off lighting to reduce crime. But a school system in California, to save money on energy during the energy crisis, found that they not only save money on electrical energy when they shut off all their lights at night, but they saved money when there was a reduction in break-ins, loitering, and even graffiti since the vandals can't see what they are painting. Ultimately, when we know better, we do better. There's so many advantages to reducing light pollution in our communities. Conservation of energy and natural resources. Better vision for safety while respecting our community character and the nocturnal environment, and we can see more stars.